Nice to see you all. It's still a little dark and rainy out there, but uh, the light of Christ is shining here. I want to thank our praise team for leading us in worship. Uh, the plans to continue doing this the second Sunday of each month have a sort of contemporary service led by our praise team. So thank you so much for being here. I can see Emily creeping up here, so I'll just let her do her announcement first. She's going to tell us a little bit about the youth gathering and how all that's going. Good morning. Um, if you'd like to pull out your uh, your worship folder. On the front page, I want to draw some attention to that. Um, every three years, the Lutheran Church um, M Missouri Synod hosts a youth uh, a, a gathering somewhere across the, the U.S. The first one was in the 80s. Um, and so the first time that we have gone in a long time was in 2019, and we went to the cities. And um, the next one is in 2022, and it is in Houston, Texas in July. Um, so we're very excited to go, but travel costs are going to be a little bit more expensive than they were to the cities. Um, and so we're asking you if you would be willing to um, support us um, in, in going. I have a few ways to tell you about that. As of right now, there are 15 youth and adults signed up to go. I'm hopeful that maybe we'll have one or two more join us. Um, kind of figured out the cost per person is about $1,600 a person. Um, and on the front sheet, it points out that we already have 9,000 of that, but our goal is 26,000. And so we have a little under a year to get to that point. So um, one way that we would love your help is called the Wall of Giving. Now we did this a couple years ago, um, but you'll see in the hall over across the way, there's a board that has envelopes on it and they all have um, a different uh, a number and they're numbered one through 100. And so what we just ask if, is if you would like to give to the youth, just grab one or two or as, as many of these as you would like. And whatever amount is on the cover, put that cash amount in, in, inside. There's a sticker on the back if you'd like to write, write your name so we can 
say thanks to you and then just stick it in the offering plate. Um, our goal is to have all of these 100, um, all of them taken. And if they are all taken, that's $5,050. And so we would love your, your help um, with that. As time goes on, um, there will be other ways for you to support us in prayer, um, and like we'll, we'll share more, more about it. So we appreciate your, your financial support, but know that that is not all we are going to ask of, of you. And so I just pray that you would just continue to keep the youth and adults in, in prayer as, as we start, um, and then we'll keep you more informed as we get, get headed, headed to go. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I want to thank everyone who was involved with the trivia night last week. Uh, many of you were there. Uh, it was a great time, good food, uh, good fellowship, and uh, a lot of good, uh, healthy competition. Let's, let's put it that way. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I've had this question already a few times today. Still no baby at home, much to my wife's chagrin and dismay, uh, but we've got to be in the home stretch. Uh, she's now officially past her due date, and so... Uh, who knows, any minute, maybe during the service. Uh, <laughs> my phone is right around the corner. Uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, so um, a few other things. We've, we've mentioned this past couple weeks. We are still in need of a business manager for the church. Um, we're kind of opening up our search, but if you uh, know of anyone who might be good for the role, if you might be good for the role, we would love to hear from you. It's a job with uh, a lot of responsibility of great service to the church, but it's also a very flexible job. If that's something you're looking for in your life, the ability to sort of come and go and work on your own schedule, it's a great job in that regard. Also, we're really excited about this two days from now, or two weeks from now, I should say, two Sundays from now, October 24th, we'll have our, our public baptism recognition and celebration. During the 1030 service on the 24th, uh, we're inviting all those families who've had children baptized over the last year and a half to come and be publicly recognized and introduced to the congregation. We had a lot of uh, COVID babies, a lot of private baptisms, and uh, baptisms are a thing to be celebrated, a thing to be witnessed. And so we're inviting, I think we're going to have 10 or 12 families here uh, at the 1030 service on the 24th uh, and a little reception after church. So I know this is the 8 o'clock crowd, but if that's something that's appealing to you, maybe come to the 1030 service that week. It should be fun. There's a trunk or treat coming up on the 30th, so uh, you can look into that. Altar flowers are beautiful. Special recognition, and we have a 60th anniversary coming up. Alan, Darlene, Ziegler, 60 years, pretty amazing. I got married too late. I'm never going to make 60 years, but uh, it's, it's really an amazing thing. Uh, so congratulations to the Zieglers. Um, and then finally, I asked Lily to take it out, our church secretary, this thing about Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't want gifts, I don't want cards. You know, you can show your appreciation by coming to church, coming to Bible class, raising your children in the fear and knowledge of the Lord. That's, that's what every pastor wants. The gifts and cards are nice, but uh, we just want you to, to, to walk in the, in the way of the Lord. That's, that's how you really show your pastor appreciation. So God bless you all for being here. I think our praise team has another song for us, so we'll stand and sing with them. to fear now for I am safe with you so when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the Oh God, the battle belongs 
Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today with thankful hearts, recognizing all the gifts that you give us, gifts that feed our bodies and our souls. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be upon us today to enliven our faith, especially faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, our teacher, our friend, and our Savior who died on the cross, that we might have eternal life. Lord, we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the scriptures, we have a wonderful promise from God that if we bring our concerns, our cares, and our confession to him, he will hear us, and he is just and merciful and he will offer us forgiveness. And so today I ask you all, do you acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you have sinned with your actions, with your words, and with your thoughts, that you have failed to do the things that God has commanded you to do, and rather you have done the things that he has forbidden? Do you acknowledge that you need forgiveness? If so, say, I do. I do. Also, do you believe that you have been forgiven. 
that Jesus, the Son of God, took on flesh, lived under the law, was perfectly obedient to the law, then offered himself up as an atoning sacrifice for your sins, my sins, and the sins of the entire world. Do you believe that you are forgiven? If so, say, I do. do. Then is my privilege, responsibility as your pastor, to share this word of mercy with you, that you are forgiven, that you are free, that your sins are not held against you. So go in the peace of the Lord, knowing that your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time we invite our children to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. I have a question for you today. I want you to think about it. I don't want you to tell me yet, okay? So just think about it in your head. Do you have something that's your favorite? Maybe it's a favorite food or a favorite toy or a favorite thing to do or a favorite activity. I want you to think about that. Hmm. Do you think of something in your head that's your favorite? A dinosaur. Ah, Elijah likes dinosaurs. All right. Who else likes dinosaurs? Anybody else like dinosaurs? Yeah, dinosaurs are pretty cool, aren't they? Fun to play with. Can I show you some favorites in our house? I brought a few things that I wanted to show you. Okay. And maybe these are some of your favorites too. So in our house, we have two things that are like the favorite. Okay. And the first one is puzzles. Who here likes to do puzzles? Me. Oh man, we have so many puzzles. Puzzles are so fun, right? You can do little ones up to big ones. Oh, this one happens to be a dinosaur puzzle. Okay, we love puzzles and dinosaurs in our house. Okay, all right, here's the next one. Maybe some of you can relate to this one. Who's this? In our house, we love superheroes. Okay, there are... Oh, awesome, very cool. So we have costumes and we have characters and we... Okay, very cool. Yeah. Whoa. Oh my goodness. It sounds like you guys like superheroes too, right? Do you have something else? You think about it and tell me later, okay? So there's lots of these things that we have favorites. Maybe, I know when I was growing up, I loved Barbies. I had lots of Barbies, and I passed some of them on to Ellen, okay? I love to play with Barbies. That was so fun. In our house, we love pizza. We eat pizza every Friday night and watch a movie. Me too. Oh, awesome. What a good thing, okay? Whoa. Oh, my goodness. So all of these things that we love that are our favorites. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you have some favorite things too. You know what else is our favorite? I gotta pull it out. What's this? I know, it's a Bible. You know, also is our favorite? Okay, who do we learn about in our Bible? Yeah, Jesus. You're right, Claire. Jesus is our favorite too. Yeah, we love Jesus and we read about Jesus and we learn about Jesus. And God, yes, and Jesus is our favorite. You know, having all of these favorite things is really good, but you know what we need to make sure that is our most favorite of all? Are you ready? You've seen this before, right? Number one, Jesus. Can you make a number one with your finger? Yeah. All of these things are our favorites, and that's great. We have lots of toys and friends and things to do, and having those favorite things is great. But Jesus should be number one. He should be our most favorite. And so everything that we do, okay, oh, just listen, okay. So everything that we do, we think Jesus is number one. Can you say that? 
Jesus is number one. You're right. Okay, let's fold our hands and say a prayer today. Okay, ready? Here we go. Dear God, we are so thankful for the things we have, especially our favorite things. Please help me to put you first above them all. and to love you most. I love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you can take a seat. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to them, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've been around church or Bible classes for a while, you know that the Bible talks about money a lot, probably more than we're comfortable with. A lot of us would say, okay, the Bible, you can do the spiritual stuff, you know, the, the love thy neighbor stuff, the God and man stuff, but, but no, God is very concerned, it seems, with our finances and our attitudes about our wealth, our money, our possessions what we do with what he has given us. So we like to sort of, sort of silo it off. There, there, there's Bible talk about money, and that's one thing. And then there's all this Bible talk, these teachings about salvation, right? About sin, about forgiveness, about redemption, about the blood of Jesus, about the resurrection on the last day. So there's money, and that's good, right? And then there's the salvation stuff. That's even better. And over here you have the, the, the Dave Ramsey type stuff, right? You know, uh, the borrower is slave to the lender and, you know, uh, a foolish man consumes all he has, but a wise man has storehouses of, of fine things. And you go on and on and on. There's all sorts of good sort of advice, biblically speaking, about money, right? Advice about being a wise investor and and all that sort of stuff. And then you have the, the main event of the scriptures, right? 
sin, salvation, being invited into God's presence, being reconciled to our maker, eternal life. But in today's gospel reading, these two worlds sort of collide. These worlds of salvation, eternal life, and a very frank discussion about wealth, about money and possessions. They're no longer kept apart, but they are brought together. And it's very fascinating stuff. It's quite illuminating, but it's challenging at the same time. I know I'd rather keep these things separate. I don't stand up here and preach about money that much, right? I'd rather preach about this other stuff. Forgiveness, life, salvation, Jesus, being kind to one another, loving God with all our heart and soul and mind. But today we can't ignore the relationship between our wealth, our possessions, our love of money, and our status in terms of eternal life. This encounter that we read the beginning of is, is a discussion between Jesus and, and a character who's unnamed in the scriptures. He's usually known as the rich young man, the wealthy young man, and he seems like a really good guy. He comes up to Jesus, and he sort of falls down in front of him, bows down, takes a knee, falls down. The, the Greek could go either way. The point is he is respectful to Christ. He acknowledges that Jesus is a good teacher. That's what he calls a good teacher. Then he asks them, asks Jesus a big question, really the big question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Right? Life on this earth is short, right? We're not guaranteed anything. We might last three months or three years or 103 years, but you never know. The big question what must I do to inherit eternal life? And think about this question, because it's a little bit loaded when you think about it. What must I do? Not to earn eternal life, not even to receive eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You don't really have to do anything to inherit something, right? But he kind of hedges his bet. What must I do to inherit eternal life? calls Jesus good teacher. Is that flattery? Is that sincerity? I think it's sincerity. And Jesus uses this little phrase here to answer his question. He answers his question with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus doesn't go right at it. He says, why do you call me good? Certainly only God alone is good. And while it doesn't sound like Jesus is answering the question, how, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Only God is good. He kind of is answering the question that maybe there's nothing we can do to earn, receive, or inherit eternal life on our own. Only God is good. But Jesus continues. He says, you know the commandments. And this is a very faithful young man, a very upright, moral, upright young man. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. Right? Don't bear false witness. Don't steal, don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Now those sound pretty familiar to us, right? It's that back half of the Ten Commandments. Those commandments that have to do with our relationship with our fellow man. Right? The loving your neighbor part of the Ten Commandments. And the rich young man says something interesting. He says, well, I've kept all of these commandments since I was young. I've kept them. I've kept these commandments. It's unlikely, right? We're studying the uh, Sermon on the Mount downstairs in adult Bible class. Just the past couple weeks, we looked at Jesus' teaching about a couple of these laws, particularly you shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery. And it's easier for us to, to kind of look at these commandments and say, yeah, I've kept that one. I've never murdered anybody. I've never stabbed anybody or put a gun to someone's head, right? I haven't murdered, so I'm doing okay there. And I've never committed adultery. I've never cheated on my wife. But when Jesus talks about these commandments, he sort of bears down. He digs in and he teaches us that these commandments are bigger than just the letter of the law. There in Matthew 5, Jesus talks about you shall not murder. And he says, well not enough just to not murder people. Have you ever hurt someone? 
Have you ever hated someone? Have you ever called someone a fool? Have you ever seen someone who needed help and you didn't help them? Right? So this commandment's bigger than just not murdering. Same thing for adultery. He says, well, it's more than just not cheating on your spouse. Right? If you've ever looked at someone with lustful intent in your heart, right? if, you, if you've sort of engaged in any sort of sexual immorality, then you're liable to this commandment. You've broken this commandment. And so the rich young man says, yes, I've, I've kept all of these commandments, never lied, never stolen, I've always honored my father and mother, never murdered, never committed adultery. I've kept all of these since I was young. Jesus does something interesting here, though. He doesn't sort of squash him. He doesn't say, oh, no, you haven't. He doesn't say that at all. In fact, he has compassion on the man. The scriptures tell us that in that moment, he loved the man. But it's a tough kind of love. It's a tough kind of love. Sort of the soft kind of love that we like in our world, the supportive kind of love would have said, well, great, you're doing fine. Keep on keeping on, right? And you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Just keep not breaking the law. That's not what Jesus says, though. He doesn't correct him. He doesn't rebuke him in that moment. But he does challenge him. He says, well, the only thing you have left to do is to sell all of your possessions Give, them, give the proceeds to the poor, right? You'll have a great reward in heaven if you do this, and then drop everything you're doing and follow me. It's a big ask, isn't it? It's a big ask. This man went away disheartened. He was sorrowful because he had great wealth. He had many possessions. He had a lot of money. He loved God but what he realized when he was challenged here by Jesus is that he loved his wealth a little bit more. He loved God, there's no doubt. He knows who Jesus is, calls him good teacher, believes in the Lord, keeps the commandments to the best of his ability. And yet when push comes to shove and Jesus says, okay, you've kept the commandments, I'll give that to you, fine. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, leave your life and follow me. He can't do it. Jesus has a lot of interactions with people in his ministry. Sometimes people go away and they're just so full of joy because of what Jesus has done for them. Other times people go away fuming, steaming mad because of what Jesus has pointed out in them, maybe some sort of hypocrisy. Very rarely does someone go away from Jesus sad. And that's what we see in our reading today. This rich young man was sad because he made this realization about himself. That even though he thought he believed in, in God, that he loved God above all things, what he realized is there's this one thing that he loved a little bit more than God. This one thing that he couldn't give up to follow Jesus his wealth, his possessions. Now, we don't know how this young man's story ends. Maybe there's a change of heart. Maybe there's a, a shift in priorities in his life. Maybe he learns to love God more than his possessions down the road. We don't know. The point is, in this moment, he can't quite get there. He can't quite let go. The disciples witnessed all this. The twelve, they're with Jesus and they, and they witness all this. And Jesus teaches them. He says, how difficult it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Difficult. Difficult. Maybe that's an understatement, right? How difficult it is. And the disciples are amazed at this teaching because prevailing belief in that day is that wealth is a sure sign of God's favor. If you have money, if you have possessions, that means you're blessed by God. And so to hear Jesus say how difficult it will be for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, 
It amazed them. This was not typical teaching. This is not what they grew up on. And if this rich young man who kept all the commandments from his youth is going to go away sad, is there any hope for them? Is there any hope for any of us? And then Jesus reiterates his point, this time with a little bit more, I don't know, pizzazz, with an illustration, even with some humor, some hyperbole. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's kind of a funny image to think about, right? He's making a point. It's sort of a proverbial statement. The biggest animal they're going to see day in and day out in that part of the world is a camel. And really the smallest conceivable thing they can really think of is the eye of a needle, right? They're not dealing with sort of subatomic particles here, right? It's easier for that camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And once again, the disciples are astonished. Good thing this is just for the rich people, right? Not for us. Some of you chuckle, right? Because you know, you know, when you look at human history, when you look at the globe today, we're the rich people. Make no mistake about that. Oh yeah, but my brother-in-law has this and that, and these people in my neighborhood have a new art. We are the rich people that Jesus is talking about. We never have to worry if our bellies are going to be fed. We don't have to worry about the rains that have been pouring down for the last 24 hours. We have a roof over our head. We've got heat in the cold. We've got air conditioning in the heat. We live better than just about anyone who's ever lived. Now, we have a tendency to be really petty and compare ourselves to others, but make no mistake about it, you are the 1%. You are the 1% of the 1%. And so it's a sobering message for us today that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for you to enter the kingdom of God. So the disciples asked the big question, the one that we would probably ask, you know, if we were there. So who can inherit eternal life? It's the question again, right? It's not about little details of this life. It's not how do I live my best life now? How do I get my kids to listen to me? Or how do I get a promotion at work? It's, it's the question. Who can inherit eternal life? How can we inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, with man, it's impossible. So it goes from difficult to impossible. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Now, we can take that little phrase out of the scriptures and apply it to all sorts of things like, I don't know, winning football games and all sorts of small things, but no, the question here is all about salvation. It's all about eternal life. Left to our own devices, based on our own merits, our own righteousness, our own obe obedience to the law, it's impossible. We're not getting in. We are not inheriting eternal life. Impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's the way. It is the only way. Christ makes the impossible possible. The most impossible thing was us, sinners, who loved other things more than God to inherit eternal life. Impossible. Christ makes it possible. And that's why we're here. That's why we worship. That's why we give thanks. Because we're slaves, we're debtors, we're lost, we're broken. We are nothing left to our own devices. We're dead. Christ makes the impossible possible. 
You know, the question that Jesus has, this discussion he has with this rich young man, it's, it's the same sort of discussion he has with us through his word. It's the, it's the question he engages us with time and time and time again through his teachings. What's most important to you? What's most important to you? In your life, what do you trust in? What gives you meaning? What gives you purpose? What gives you security? What do you look to? This man goes away sad from Jesus because he realizes that it's not God. It's his wealth. It's his possessions. It's all sorts of things. The question we all need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves today is, what's most important to you? What's number one at the top of the list? What do you trust in? What gives your life meaning and purpose? What gives you security? It can be sort of condemning, right? We all love God. I have no doubt about that. This rich young man loved God. But do we love God the most? It's the first commandment, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You love God, I know that. But when push comes to shove, when the finger is in our face, like Jesus puts his finger in the face of this rich young man, if he asked you to give up everything and follow him, could you? Would you? It's very, very challenging. We're going to pass the offering plate in a minute. I don't preach about money. You've known me for a year now. I don't like talking about it. It's not my favorite thing, but we can't deny that it is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, idol out there. What we look to to give our lives meaning and purpose, to tell how we're doing, to look to it for security. We're going to pass the offering plate in a while. Why do we do that? You ever thought about that? There are some practical reasons, right? We need to keep the lights on, and I like to be paid, you know, so I can feed my kids and stuff, but... But why do we do that? Why has that been such an important thing for the church since the beginning of the church? Our offerings. Well, there's a few reasons, right? We want to show our thanks to God for all that he has provided for us. Right? That's a reason, right? It's sort of us giving our thanks to God, showing his worth in our lives, right? And, and also we want to help those in need. And the church does that. And you support the ministries of the church through your offerings, Whether it's in foreign fields or here in our area, we support people who are in need through our offerings. And then there's the stewardship question. By by putting our money in the offering plate, we are recognizing that, that God is the one who owns everything and he entrusts money and possessions to us so that we use what he has given us to his glory to serve our neighbors, right? So it's this question of stewardship that that I'm going to return some of what God has given me, some of what God already owns to the ministry of his church. But the reason I want you to think about today for your offerings is it helps us confront our love of money, which is something we always need to be confronting. Right? We learn this in the scriptures, right? We hear it big and bold, right? The love of money is the root of all evil, right? Jesus preaches in the Sermon on the Mount, we'll probably talk about, it, talk about it today in Bible class, that you can't serve two masters, right? You can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. You can't serve both God and money. So money can be a master. It can be our Lord. And so one of the reasons we pass the offering plate, one of the reasons we collect offering, offerings is to combat our love of money. When we put our envelope in the offering plate or we click submit if we're giving online, what we're saying is money, you are not my master. You are not my Lord. You are not my God. You cannot save me. It's part of why we do the offering thing. To confront our love of money. To say Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my master. And only he can save me. So my friends, the big question is the big question today. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, it's 
pretty impossible. There's not a lot that we can do. But with God, all things are possible. So make sure God, who makes the impossible possible, make sure he's number one in your life. Make sure that you love him above all things, that you serve him above all things. Make sure that he is your Lord, he is your master, not money. Because money can't save you, but Jesus can. Thanks be to God. Amen. We stand for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we pray for Joe Duke, Mark Moratis, Marla Ziegler, Shelley, a friend of Ted and Sue Helms, Anna Bichenauer, Ken Schmidt, Dave Seibel, Steve Bussey, Joanne Fickner, Ruth Barsgard, and Keith Strand. We also pray for the family of Robert Chone, uh, the father of Colette Christoffers, and the family of Dwayne Heideman, uh, who's the father-in-law of Pastor Zellers in Swanville, Minnesota. Um, Robert and Dwayne both passed away this week, so we pray for their families during this difficult time. Heavenly Father, we come before you with full hearts and with the gift of faith. We pray for your church, not just this congregation, our Redeemer, Lutheran Church in Moorhead, Minnesota, but, but your church throughout this state, this country, and the world, wherever the good news of Jesus is proclaimed, where people are baptized and receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask that you bring more and more to faith and that you enliven and strengthen the faith of those whom you have called. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our communities. We pray for our cities. We pray that everyone be given fairness, that everyone be treated with dignity and respect, that you give our leaders wisdom, and that you give us a free and peaceful society. And Lord, we pray for seasonable weather. We pray for a, a peaceful earth. Lord, we thank you for the rains that you've caused to fall. Uh, we thank you for taking care of our fields. Uh, and Lord, keep us safe from all unseasonable weather, especially as we approach fall and, and then winter time. We pray for all those who work, Lord, for those who have difficult jobs, for those who have di dangerous jobs, for those who serve in very difficult conditions, we pray especially for healthcare workers, our doctors and nurses on the front lines of the coronavirus. We pray for our military members, our police and our firefighters, those who sacrifice their health and safety and even their lives so that we might be safe. And Lord, we pray for all those in need. We pray for those who go without the basic things that we take for granted, the, the hungry and the homeless. Lord, we ask that you Watch out for them and provide for them. We pray for those who are in a difficult time emotionally, for the widowed and orphaned, and all those who are isolated from those that they love. And Lord, we pray for the sick and the dying and all those who care for them. Today, we raise up to you those who need an extra measure of your healing care. Joe, Mark, Marlis, Shelley, Anna, Ken, Dave, Steve, Joanne, Ruth, and Keith. We also pray for the family and friends of Robert and Dwayne who, who mourn their passing, Lord. Give them confidence in the resurrection on the last day. Give them the peace that surpasses all human understanding. And remind them that for those who die in the faith, they will have eternal life. Finally, Lord, we pray for all of our needs of body and soul. We ask that you give us our daily bread and that you guide and guard us from all evil and all danger. So we pray to the Lord. Amen. Amen. This time, we can be seated and worship the Lord with our offerings.
Trophies one will crumble into dust when it's said and done. Cause all the really matters. Did I live the truth to the ones I love? Was my life the proof that there is only one whose name will last forever? we stand and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing our closing song. The 
power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, and I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, 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 all oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, and I would be set free. sing for all that you've done for me. Please be seated. Well, thank you all for joining us for worship this morning. I want to thank our praise team for leading us. Uh, a lot of talented people who uh, give their time and their, and their energy to us. So thank you very much for leading us in worship today. Uh, love to see you downstairs for adult Bible class. Love to see the kids in Sunday school. And just remember what today was all about. Love God. There's a lot of things that will say, uh, I can provide for you. I can give you security. I'm the most important thing. Today we learn that God does the impossible, right? He makes possible those things that we think are impossible. Top of that list is securing our eternal life. So live in that knowledge and that peace this day. Our praise team will have one more song for us, and I'll see you in the hallway. God bless.